My name is Kieran O'Connor. I'm a lecturer in medieval archaeology uh, at the National University of Ireland, uh, Galway. Um, my research interests include things like medieval rural settlement, uh, Gaelic Ireland, the archaeology of Gaelic Ireland, we'll say in the 12th, 13th, 14th century. I'm also interested in castles and how they developed over time, and also the medieval landscape what the medieval landscape uh, would have looked like uh, originally. And of course, as part of my work at NUI Galway, um, I'm involved in collaboration with various uh, European archaeologists and British archaeologists, and I'm part of the Chateau Geyer and Ruralia Research Network. Is medieval settlement in County Leitrim, in what, what was, or, sorry, what became County Leitrim during the late 12th, 13th and 14th century. Remember Leitrim as a county only really came into being in 1583. Beforehand it was part of the Kingdom of Brefne and lordship, a later uh, O'Rourke lordship of, of, of West Brefne, Brefne O'Rourke. Now, one question that, you know, it, it, it will be asked is, well, what did Leitrim look like during the medieval period? And very often when you talk to people, they believe that the later county, as I say, West Brefney, as it was known, uh, would have been heavily wooded. Well, to a certain extent, we do have evidence for quite an amount of woods, uh, deciduous woodland, natural native deciduous woodland, Early maps suggest that, you know, early maps a little bit later than the period that we're dealing with, we'll say late 16th, early 17th century, show quite an amount of woodland in Leitrim. We hear, for example, in the annals in the 13th century, we hear of the deep woods of Conwechna in South Leitrim, in the Drumlin country of South Leitrim. We also have woodland around places like Loch Allen, Loch Melvin. But really, you'd be quite surprised to know that Leitrim during the 12th, 13th, 14th century and later was actually quite an org had quite an organised agricultural landscape. So there were woods, place name evidence suggests that, but also a lot of productive farmland. Again, the type of farming would have been mixed farming with a strong emphasis on dairy and beef. Cattle we know from you know, the various historical records and archaeological excavation in the general region of northwest Ireland that Gaelic lords, like the O'Rourkes and people like that in Leitrim, had very large herds of cattle. Now, again, the cattle that were used during, you know, that were, were, that were rare during uh, medieval times were much smaller than today's cattle. Probably um, the ancestors, if you like, of the modern Kerry Dexter, but also, I think in this area, Irish moiled cattle. Cattle or beasts during the medieval period were required, if you like, on average, produced about 200 pounds of beef on average. So they were much smaller than today's cattle. And of course, that meant that there was less poaching of ground and things like that. Anyway, so a mixed farm landscape with an emphasis on beef and dairy production. Now, the other thing about farming in this period, and indeed later in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, even going on into the 19th century, uh, is a practice known as bullying. Now, it seems during the medieval period, Gaelic lords in northwest Ireland and elsewhere in Ireland and places like Brefney uh, did not save hay. What happened instead was that during the summer, cattle and indeed other livestock were brought to mountain 
or marginal pastures. They were brought to upland areas or marginal lowland pastures and they used the summer grass there. They were, they were kept there throughout the summer. At the permanent home farms and settlements, the Shanwalia, uh, grass was fenced off and kept as feed in the winter. So when cattle came back, these large herds of cattle came back from the Bully pastures, uh, say in late autumn, we'll say at the end of October, early November, um, the summer grass, which had been kept, was used for grazing. Now this kind of pr practice of moving, we transhumance bullying, this practice of mo moving cattle from permanent pastures up to upland pastures um, meant that large herds of cattle could be kept by both ordinary farmers but also by the great lords, uh, Gaelic lords of Leitrim during this period. Now just for your information, J.J. McDermott, who's an uh, archaeologist from Kilty Clahar, and is now making a great career for himself as an archaeologist in Western Australia, has found Bully, medieval Bully sites in the hills above the McClancy Canoich or centre at uh, Ross Clahar. And Mark Gardner from the University of Lincoln and myself have found uh, actually one Bully hut, but there are more, um, up in the hills above Ballinaglera, above uh, Loch Allen. And of course there are late historical references to bullying taking place at that spot. Another question that you may ask if we're talking about farming and landscape, well who lived in the landscape? Who lived in Leitrim during the medieval period? As I said before we're concentrating really on the late 12th, 13th, 14th century, but what I'm going to say is true for the 15th and 16th and 17th, early 17th century too. The great family of course of modern County Leitrim of West Brefney were of course the O'Rourke's. They were really the overlords of West Brefney. But other families, vassal clans if you like, were also important and these include the McClancy's of uh, Dartry with their Kianoich, as I said a moment ago at Ross Clahar. The McReynolds or Reynolds as they're now known, the Reynolds of Muncher Oilish in South County Leitrim in the Drumlin country of South County Leitrim. As far as I'm concerned their Kianoich was close to where Loch Rin Hotel is now. And then other families like the McCogans from outside Drumahair the McConsolvers or Fords from no, north, lo, northern side of Loch Allen, the Mulvies from around Carrick and Shannon, the McFerguses, the Earlies of Drum Riley, a branch of the O'Dignans, of course another branch of the O'Dignans lived in this parish here in Kilronan, uh, in, 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 we're in County Roscommon now. Um, you know, so these are at least some of the families that lived in medieval Leitrim. But the main point there, that the, the main family of course were the O'Rourke's with the next in rank were really the McClancy's and the McReynolds or Reynolds's. But of course we must remember that the Anglo-Normans arrived in Ireland in 1169. So what impact did the Anglo-Normans have on what later became the county of Leitrim, West Brefney as we, as we call it. The answer is really very little. In 1221 the de Lacy Lord, Lords of Meath granted uh, land in South Leitrim, I would think it's South Leitrim, to Philip de Nangle, de Angulo, known in Irish as Costello or Macostello. These were an Anglo-Norman family who came to Ireland with the de Lacy's in the late 12th century were granted land in, in Meath but tried to push into Leitrim in the second quarter and of the 13th century. Now we know the Denangles built castles in South Leitrim. We're not quite sure of their location or what those castles would have looked like. 
but it is clear that by the late 1240s, the Irish of Leitrim, in particular the O'Rourke's, with help from the O'Connors from over in Roscommon, had pushed the Denangles out. And the Denangles then proceeded to uh, develop their original land grant in Meath, but also a new land grant in East, well, what, in, in East Mayo, Ros modern Roscommon border around the Balahadreen area. So we don't have any long-term Anglo-Norman stroke English settlement in the Leitrim area during, if you like, the Anglo-Norman period. Leitrim is one of those areas that remained under the control of the Gaelic elite, in particular the O'Rourke's. But it isn't all just the question of Gael versus Gaul, Anglo-Norman versus native Irish or so, because it's clear that the O'Connors in Roscommon who were the hereditary kings of Connacht, had lost out to the Anglo-Normans, the Anglo-Norman uh, Anglo de Burrs, later Burks, after 1235, and had lost control of a lot of the province of Connacht. So they started to move into Leitrim to try to, to expand their power into Breffney. So the O'Rourke's not only had problems eventually with the, you know, which had problems with the Denangles, the Anglo-Norman Denangles and Delacy's, they also had problems with the O'Connors. And by, I think there was even a group of O'Connors, the Clan Murta O'Connors, who tried to settle in Leitrim. But by the second half of the 14th century, the O'Rourke's had pushed back the O'Connors as well as the Denangles, as I said, much earlier than the O'Connors. And the O'Rourke's remained in control of the modern Leitrim area, really down to the end of the Nine Years' War, late 16th, 17th century or so. The other thing too then, if we, we, you know, we mentioned castles a couple of minutes ago, where did all these O'Rourke's and McClancy's, McRannells, McCogan's, Ford's, Mulvey's, Early's, McFerguses, Mallinson's, McMailisa, where did these people actually live? Well, again, if you asked, you know, a, a colleague of mine from England or from France or Germany, they would say, well, if you want to find where the elite, you know, the, the, the elite of any given area in Europe lived during these, this period, just look for castles and you will find that. What we do notice, however, in Leitrim and other Gaelic areas of late 12th, 13th, 14th century Ireland is that there's very little evidence for what contemporaries then and modern scholars now would consider to be castles. Now, some of you are going to turn around to me and say, well, look, there's, there's quite a few castles in Leitrim. Yes, that is true, but they all date to the 15th or 16th century or to the plantation of Leitrim after uh, the, the early 1620s. You know, places like Manor Hamilton Castle appear to be built in the 1630s. J.J. McDermott, who I mentioned earlier, has done a lot of work on tower houses of 15th, 16th century date. So, of course, castles exist in the Leitrim landscape, but for the period we're looking at, there isn't a lot of physical evidence. It, from that period, if you like, from the later 12th century, 13th century, and 14th century. There is little evidence for, as I say, what contemporaries then and modern archaeologists and historians would regard as castles. So people had to live somewhere. Where did they live? Well, the first thing that we note is that there was continuity from the early medieval period in the choices of places that people lived in. For example, in 2002, the Discovery Programme's uh, Lake Settlement Project, under the direction of Dr. Christina Friedengrin, who is, Grin, who is not from Leitrim, is actually from Sweden, obviously, with, um, basically carried out a radiocarbon dating programme in the Upper Shannon area, but particularly in County Leitrim radiocarbon dating program taking timbers from Cranogues, artificial islands, if you like, in the lakes of Leitrim, and found that not only 
where these Cranogues occupied during the early medieval period, we'll say from the 5th, 6th century up to the 11th, 12th century, but these sites continue to be occupied down to the 17th century. Furthermore, we have historical references to Cranogues being occupied. For example, we have a reference in 1247, I think it's in the Annals of Connacht, to the Cranog of Clainloch uh, being lived in by the McRannells. Now, it would take too long to explain, but in my opinion, Clainloch is the, one of the Cranogs on Loch Rin. And the radiocarbon dating program, taking timbers from Cranogs across Leitrim, has shown, as I just said, that uh, the dates coming back from them are indicating that they were occupied right beyond the 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, 15th century, 16th century, and even into the first years of the 17th century. And one of those Cranogs uh, where, we, uh, where timbers were taken from and dated, radiocarbon dating, um, was, was on Loch Rin. So it would seem to me that it's probably likely that 1247 McRannell uh, reference to a Cranog is actually on Loch Rin. We also have references to Cranogs in the historical sources on Glen Carr Lake, um, possibly on Loch Skur. Um, we also, of course, have reference to some O'Rourke fortress on Cherry Island on Garadice Loch near Ballinamore. Ballin so island fortresses, usually artificial islands, little islands, maybe 20, 30 metres in diameter, uh, with palisades around them and dwelling houses uh, within them. These Cranogs were lived in by the Gaelic elite in Leitrim during the period that we're talking about. What else? Well, there is some reference references, or sorry, there is some excavated evidence uh, and historical and literary evidence for the use of moated sites by the Gaelic Irish elite. These are a type of wooden fort, rectangular in shape, uh, during this period, maybe later 13th, early 14th century. And we have some evidence for moated sites in County Leitrim, but not very many. So Cranogues definitely continue to be used, these artificial island fortresses that are particularly common on the Drumlin Lakes. We have, I think, probably about 80 probable and possible Cranogues within the county of Leitrim. These continue to be occupied. But what else? Well, it's possible looking on, an, you know, elsewhere, excavated evidence elsewhere for the continued occupation of ring forts and cashels. Cashels are dry stone walled ring forts. Ring forts, uh, earthen ring forts, had timber buildings and defences on them and around them. And we know from elsewhere uh, in, the, in Western Ireland that there is increasing evidence to show that these are not just early medieval in date, in other words, between the 5th, 6th century and about the 11th century AD. But just like Cranogs, they continue, at least some of them, continue to be occupied uh, well into uh, the 15th, 16th, maybe even the first years of the 17th century. Um, there's no direct evidence for this in Leitrim at present because there's been little in the way of excavation, but we can see it in other counties. For example, at Rockingham, um, there is evidence for a ring fort being, an occupied ring fort being turned into a moated site in the late 13th century. And also in County Clare, my colleague Michelle Comber has shown that the cashel there at Carr McConnell was built in the 8th century AD but continued to be occupied right down to the 17th century. So to answer the question then, summarise it if you like, if we're looking at things like where did people live in Leitrim, where did those, we'll say O'Rourke's, McClancy's, McRannell's, Mulvey's, Ford's, etc. live during this period, late 12th to around 1400 or so, and in, okay, we would say uh, 
They lived in artificial island fortresses known as Cranogs, and there's a good possibility that some ring forts and cashels within County Leitrim were also occupied by these people. Now again, in terms of numbers, I think there's something like six to 700 ring forts and cashels within the present county of Leitrim recognized by archeologists. So it would seem to me to a certain extent, at least some of these places continue to be occupied and used as uh, estate centers, farm centers, administrative centers uh, and residences uh, by the Gaelic elite. We've mentioned Cranogs and Ring Forts as possibly being the places where the Gaelic elite, the O'Rourkes, etc., lived in Leitrim during the period that we're looking at. Where did ordinary people live? Well, there's a, a lot of evidence for dispersed settlement uh, throughout Northwest Ireland at this time, but there, I also feel that there were little uh, nucleated settlements, the equivalent of small villages, clusters of houses belonging to, we'll say, the ordinary people existing on the shore close to these cran oaks or beside these ring fort cashels and possibly also at parish church sites of which I might add there, there are quite a number of medieval uh, parish churches uh, in Leitrim. Again, indicating quite a lot of wealth in Leitrim during the 13th, 14th, 15th century, uh, etc. So little clusters of houses, if you like, belonging to ordinary people, maybe ten, you know, five, ten houses of ordinary people existing on the shore opposite these cranogs or beside, on dry land, if you like, and also close to these uh, ring forts. Here we are at Gortinti Loch, which is located on the main Dublin Sligo Road between Drumsna and Ochnacliff. These were artificial islands, but they were both residences and places of defence during the period, certainly from uh, the 5th, 6th century AD, but work in the Loch Gara area would show some of them probably date to the late Bronze Age, Iron Age. But for our purposes, they continue to be occupied as both residences and defensive sites beyond 1100, throughout the 12th and 13th and 14th century, and even 15th and 16th century. We actually have depictions of them on the Bartlett maps, uh, which date to about 1602, depictions of, of them occupied Cranogs. So they're a long lived, if you like, a long occupied monument type in the Irish landscape. In terms of locations, they don't just occur in lakes. They tend to occur in the Drumlin Lakes uh, of the area from, we'll say, Mayo right across the County Down, with a lot of examples in places like North Ross Common, South Sligo, South Leitrim, the Drumlin country of South Leitrim, where we are now, uh, County Cavan, County Fermanagh, Monaghan, and uh, into Armagh and down. So really the Drumlin country along the North Connacht, Ulster, South Ulster uh, area. In terms of numbers, people have identified, other archeologists have identified up to 1500 examples of Cranogs uh, in Irish lakes. In terms of construction, how were Cranogs constructed? Now, when I was at college, there was a tendency to say, well, Cranogs were built of a mix of earth, stones, wood, uh, etc. And that's certainly true for the Midland examples. But certainly up here in North Connacht, Leitrim, Lower Connacht, as it was called, Brethney, uh, in the Middle Ages, a lot of Cranogs really consist of a dump of stones in a relatively shallow part of the lake. And they're kept in place by posts knocked into the to to the shore to the uh, uh, floor of the lake to keep cranogs from moving in bad bad weather so really to me anyway a dump of stones creating a habitation platform maybe 15 to 30 meters in 
um, in extent. When they were in use, we would have had a palisade around the uh, edge of the habitable dry island, a palisade may be made of post and wattle or planks. For example, quite close to here, I know of a Cranog where you can actually still see the planks uh, where they've collapsed into the water. And of course, that's the other thing about Cranogs. Uh, because they're located in a watery environment, quite a lot of the timber associated with them is still preserved. And that has allowed archaeologists to take both radiocarbon dates and dendrochronological dates from, well, particularly oak timbers. And again, what surprised a lot of people uh, right throughout uh, uh, Ireland is not, a, not only are these Cranogs, if you like, early medieval and dates, I said a few minutes ago, you know, 5th, 6th century uh, on to the 11th, 12th century, there's clear evidence that the radiocarbon dates and dendrochronological dates are showing us that they continue to be occupied or at least there was occupation during the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, and even very early 17th century. So Cranogs are late, continue to be occupied much later than we uh, actually believed. In terms of function, to me anyway, Cranogs seem to be the defended homes of the elite in society. For the period we're looking at, the 11th, 12th century onwards, Gaelic lords, both high-ranking Gaelic lords and lower, more local lords, would have lived at these places. In my opinion, there would have been a house and a feasting hall, if you like, out on the Cranog, and there would also have been some form of dry land settlement where there were agricultural and administrative buildings associated with the landed estate that the person who lived in the Cranog and dryland residence on the shore opposite it uh, would um, dryland residents, uh, uh, sorry, dryland buildings, uh, agricultural administrative buildings said a couple of minutes ago um, would, uh, would have existed. Um, what would these timber buildings or stone buildings, what would they have looked like? Well, again, that's somewhat difficult to say, but certainly at an earlier period, post and wattle was used. We have evidence for that continuing on throughout our period, 12th, 13th, 14th century, um, 15th century. It, it's an interesting choice at that late date for building material. Um, we also have evidence of timber frame buildings, I think, uh, and occasionally on some stone buildings. But of course, Cranogs to a certain extent weren't suitable really for stone buildings because of the weight of them. Dry land residences and dry land buildings close by are, as I said a minute ago, are another feature. And we don't know a lot about that, this at present because when people have excavated these sites they've tended to concentrate on the Cranog itself and not on the shore opposite. But increasing evidence, including evidence from near Ockervas in County Leitrim, are showing that there were, were uh, shoreline settlements associated with, with these uh, sites. Looking at the evidence from the archaeological inventory of Leech, County Leitrim, compiled by Mick Moore of the Archaeological Survey, about 80 probable, a little over 80 probable and possible Cranogs have been identified within the bounds of the modern county. Now there are Cranogs in North Leitrim, for example the, the very well known at Ross Clogher Lake on Loch Melvin, but really the great majority of Leitrim Cranogs occur in the southern portion of the county, the Drumlin area, you know, Mohill, uh, you know, Balnamore South, uh, this area here around Drumsna, southern, southern Leitrim. Um, there, we, we know, as I said, that there are direct references to uh, a Cranog in 1247 on what I believe to be Loch Rin. The Cran there are a number of Cranogs in Loch Rin, and we're also in the good position to say that there are some radiocarbon dates that date to the, the 
13th, 14th, 15th century uh, from that from Cranogs on that lake. But we would think that at least uh, one Cranog on that lake was the centre of the McRannell or Reynolds Lordship of Muncher Olish. So these are important sites lived in by Gaelic lords of the first rank and also the minor elite in, in uh, Brefney and West Brefney during the period that we're looking at. Another uh, important Cranog would of course be the Cranog at Ross Clogher. Now it has a later castle placed upon it, Tower House Castle, probably at some stage in the late 15th or 16th century. But prior to that date, the Cranog with wooden defences and a wooden probably uh, timber house on it was actually the centre of the McClancy Lordship of Dartry. Um, a number of other Cranogs can be associated with the O'Rourkes, who were the overlords of the Leitrim area during uh, the medieval period. So the existence of Cranogs helps us understand why there's little in the way, certainly for the 12th, 13th, 14th century, there's very little evidence for what contemporaries then and modern scholars now would consider to be castles in the European sense. Cranogs appear to be uh, the defended residences and estate centres of the Gaelic elite in Leitrim. Now we do find uh, in the 15th century in particular, we'll say from 1400 onwards, it would appear that at least some Gaelic lords in Leitrim were beginning to build masonry castles, relatively small masonry castles known as tower houses. But we also have evidence, radiocarbon and uh, uh, historical evidence, showing that Cranogs also continued to be occupied in the 15th and 16th century. So they occurred in the same landscape as tower houses. In other words, if you walk through Leitrim in the 15th or 16th century, you would see some Gaelic lords, some McRannells, some uh, O'Rourke, some uh, McClancy's and others, Fords, actually living in tower houses, but other others continue to be occupy to occupy and live in Cranogs. So, as I said earlier, Cranogs are are a, 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 a very long, if you like, lived monument type occupation site in the Irish landscape.